Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Impact the World. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, and if you are a regular listener or viewer of the show, it really supports us as an independent show if you hit subscribe on YouTube or if you're listening over on Apple Podcasts to leave a rating, a review and subscribe. That helps us reach more people. So thank you for doing that. Today, I have a really incredible guest. Her name is Regina Louise. And she was someone who, someone over at my publisher recommended to me. Uh, she just had this fantastic book come out, which is called Permission Granted. And so she was coming on the show to talk about her new book. And in the process, I asked Regina about her first book and the origin of writing it. And Regina has a really extraordinary story that she has been through 30 different foster care homes and facilities as a child. And the book that she wrote, which came out in 2013, was all about that journey and about her having to learn how to feel wanted. So it's no great surprise that she has come out as this incredible teacher of self-love with this new book. But interestingly, because I asked her about that, we ended up having a very vulnerable and heartfelt explanation from Regina about not only her experiences, but her journey with and through that whole time in her life. So this interview went straight in at the deep end and there's so much to learn from the experience of being with Regina in her heart, in her truth, and in her sharing about not only the trauma she went through, but how she is dealt with it and come through it. And I, as Regina herself says, her story is far more common than we might think. So whether you identify with the details of her story or just some of the feelings and experiences she shares, I know that you're going to find a lot of richness in this incredibly, I will say, bold and brave sharing from Regina at a, at a depth and a level that we don't often get on this show. Uh, so. I just want to preface that so that you can sit back and really take in the medicine of this episode and the brilliance of Regina Louise. As ever, we put all links in the show notes underneath the video and the audio versions, and you can find more about Regina at her website, IamReginaLouise.com. For now, let's tune in and hear from Regina. So welcome, Regina, to the show. It's, it's so lovely to have you here. And I shared with you just before we got started that I was driving to the office this morning, listening to you, talking, well, reading some of your book, Somebody, Someone. And it was a video that's about six years old now, but I told you I had tears in my eyes, not just because of your story, mm -hmm. but you, my friend, are a master storyteller. And the way that you embodied your story and, and drew us in, just I was in the car and everything in me was alive, which was beautiful. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your being. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for being here on Impact the World. I am honored, Lee. And thank you for sharing your platform with me. That means everything. Well, Regina, I have to say, I, I didn't know you or your work before, and the wonderful Kim Corbin at New World Library knocked on mine and Wendy's door and said, I have someone really special for you. So we got to have a look at some videos, and some of, and, and your story is, is just extraordinary and, and mind-blowing, and, and what you not only went through as a child, but how you have now turned that into a teachable force for the world is incredible. Mm -hmm. So... Your first book was Somebody's Someone, and it was your memoir about everything you went through as a child. So perhaps for anyone who's new to you, um, you could perhaps just give us an overview of, of, of your incredible story. Right. Well, Somebody's Someone begins when I am close to 11 years old. I have no idea how I wound up 
being cared for by the same woman who had been in charge of caring for my own mother. My mother had her first child at 13, and then five years later, she had me. And I was born at a time when it was incredibly challenging for, at that time, it felt like I lived in a rural area. And if I were to think of Austin, you know, 50 something years ago in respect to how it is now, and then that in relationship to California, which is far more liberal and, and uh, open-minded, I can see how difficult it was for the people I lived with to make ends meet, to make meaning out of their circumstances, given that they were caught, right, in the crosshairs of, of us as Black people fighting for the right to breathe, mm. fighting for the right to be sovereign beings. So I, I was born into people who were hurting, and we all know the axiom by now, hurting people hurt people. And one day I decided I don't want to hurt anymore. That, that's not authentic to who I am, to walk around you know, with flesh wounds and from the abuse of being beaten with water hose, cut off gardening hoses and extension cords pulled from irons and hot wheel tracks. I thought, mm, the children I'm reading about, they're not experiencing this. So something's terribly, terribly uh, here. And it's, it's time for me to go. And I made a pact with God that should my caretaker abuse me, hit me one more time, that would be a sign from, from God that she was going to kill me and that I should leave, you know, and that may sound extreme. I, in my 50 plus years, I've never met an 11 year old with that kind of temerity, mm -hmm. with that type of conviction and or permission, but that's who I was. And I imagine Again, all my life, I've heard about how big I am. And I imagine that day I stepped into my bigness, to the magnanimity of the spirit that I would, that would be with me, beside me for the rest of my life. And I would have to move in that kind of bigness. And so you took yourself into the foster care system. Mm -hmm. I turned myself over after that day where I was beaten so badly. And I had to keep my pact, you know, with myself, with my own integrity. And so I refused to go home. I wasn't going to live there. So I was sent to live with my biological mom, who I, I scantly remembered. I, you know, I had... I had glimpses of her, you know, flashes of memory, but nothing substantive enough to say I would recognize her had she been walking down the street. And I was sent to live with her and that didn't pan out. And she had a boyfriend that it, it was improper for me to be in home with such a person. And I, my sister worked over time to make sure that she could find my biological father because she knew that I had, my mother had, had spoken about him. And so she found his number, called him and said, you, you have to come get her. Otherwise um, our mother's boyfriend will probably do horrible things to her. He's already doing horrible things to her and it's only going to get worse. So I left. And I just made a vow. I will never go back to Texas. And then I made a vow. I, I, I won't do my mother. I won't do her anymore. 
And then I came to California to live with my father, who at the time worked with and for Barry White. And, you know, he's this beautiful, very, very, very bright African-American man who is doing his best to to be an artist in a space where, you know, oftentimes it must have felt there's only room for one, Mm. you know, and it's not that different now. If I look at how many, if I look at how many, you know, I think we have Tamron Hall now, but if I think about how complex it is for there to be more Oprah's, right? right? Right. To have more Maya Angelou's, you know, for, for people who identify as such as myself, especially as a woman, as a black woman, oftentimes, you know, there's just not a lot of room for, for multitudes of us at mm-hmm. one time. So I imagine my father must have run into that definitely in the 70s, trying to also be a soulful crooner with Barry White. So that didn't work out for him. And he you know, could no longer function as a result of of what he wasn't allowed to do. So he wasn't allowed to do music on his own terms. Therefore, he believed he could not be the human being he was born to be. And therefore, he refused to have anything else. And so there I went my existence within his realm just sort of fell through the cracks and I had, I picked myself up and thought, no, I'm done with you people. I'm done. And so I turned myself over to the Richmond police department because he had left me with a family who brutally abused me when he refused or stopped paying the agreed upon uh, stipend. And so I thought, and then of course they, that woman, you know, became physically violent against my sovereign being. And so I had to stop her too. Mm. And uh, that's when I turned myself in and thought, okay, we're done. Like, you don't get second chances. None of you will ever, 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 ever get a chance to do what you've done to me ever again. And I'm that woman. I, I keep my solemn vows. Mm. Mm. And so when you went into the care system, what was that experience like? How how did that go for you? Mm. Well, it, it, it was rough. And I think it's best described in the movie, I Am Somebody's Child, the Regina Louise story. I think I can't do my story any better justice than the visual emotional roller coaster ride that that little film little television movie has the power to do so i'm going to say <laughs> tell people to go to amazon prime Definitely. and watch it and and even just the trailer so this is the lifetime movie that was released in early 2019 and it's called i am somebody's child the regina um, louis Story. Regina Louise story and just the trailer alone gives you like a, a just a, a very visceral a visceral experience of it in just those three minutes but what hit me so much learning about your story and reading your story was this incredible woman who wanted to adopt you who was forbidden from adopting you could could you just share some of that part because that's been so intrinsic to not only your writings but your journey and, yeah. and Really blue that that just reading about that was heartbreaking for me. So I can't yeah. imagine what it was like to live through for you and for her. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna take a breath. I'm always cognizant of not re-traumatizing myself. So I I need to take a little a little bio pause and just check in with my breathing. I've been a little tender these last couple of days. Yeah. Dealing with grief and giving it what it deserves. So let me just check in. I'm going to slow my nervous system down and get in the moment. Yes. So 
You mentioned Jean Kerr. She was a counselor at the Edgar Children's Shelter in Martinez, California, who wanted to be my mother. And she wasn't allowed to because she's white and I'm black. And nothing in the world could move my then social worker in the movie known as Gwen Ford, let's just call her Gwen Ford, nothing was going to move her enough for her, for her to go along with the adoption. And so as it happens in so many cases where bureaucracy is left to mitigate on behalf of the heart, hmm. I ended up losing the chance at some type of a normative childhood belonging. You know, if I look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs physiologically, having that, having the memory, the muscle memory of having a home. And then, so that's that physiological, the base, the base is physiological, home, bed, roof over the head. And then we go to this sense of safety. So I could have had safety. And then from that safety, I, I could have experienced love from a place of belonging. And then from that, to get a sense of esteem. So I, I have my physiological needs met. My safety, I understand what it means to be safe in the world, where the world ends and I begin. And then, oh my goodness, that love and belonging, because that love and belonging comes out of safety, right? And then to have the esteem that I am loved, I belong, I'm safe in the world, and there's a place for me. And then the next, self-actualization. So, you know, so to, to be denied that, I'm 50 years old. And I don't have muscle memory of a sense of place, of, of having those physiological needs met. I have worked all of my 50 years to be safe. And to understand and to redefine and to, and to conjure up what that means for me. Because the normative ways in which a human being is indoctrinated into what it means to be safe, I didn't have that. Yeah. So I've, ha I've improvised and I've acted as if. And then the love and belonging, I, yeah, you know. My book, Bootstrap Your Ways to Unconditional Self-Love, because that's all I know. All I know is unconditional self-love. And then that idea of esteem, it's, it's only, again, in, in the last decade that esteem is less important to me. How I feel about myself is is hasn't been as important to me until now. But for me, it has always been, what can I produce? How can I perform in a way that keeps me safe, that helps me belong, that gets me the love I was led to believe I need outside of myself? You know, I've had to work with all of this. So... Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you for thank you for sharing that with us. I think one of the things that struck me about you, Regina, was when I first saw you, and I think I, I first saw, and I'm, I'm just going to hold up your beautiful book here, which is called Permission Granted, and um, the, you know, I'm always I'm always thrilled when the cover of a book really embodies the energy of a book, and this one really does. Um, all of the colors and all of the multidimensionality, uh, they're all in this book. And so I first met you 
as this force of nature cheerleader, <laughs> this wisdom giver, um, inspirational force. And I and I remember when I first watched the video I was I, of you the first time. I remember thinking, oh wow, there's going to be so many people who will come to you for that very strength. And then the more I got to know about your story, of course, it goes without saying that it's often the strongest, most present people who have known the biggest horrors, because you can you can take that that whole journey. And you you mentioned it about five minutes ago. You you said I'm often called big. You know, I'm often referred to as I have a big energy, and yet the thing I'm most impressed by with you is how well you know your small self mm. as someone who has had to learn. Like I think many of us sensitive people have had to learn how to figure out who my small self is and what he needs. Uh, because I think most of us were trying to figure out whatever our circumstances, our coping strategies to get whatever needs met that we needed met that perhaps weren't being met. And your story is such an extreme example of that. It doesn't at all surprise me that you have come out into the world and want to radiate this for people. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so thank you for for sharing some of that. And I was so struck when you, in the in the the part of your book that you were reading, that I was listening to this morning, you talk about going on the Tavis Smiley show, mm -hmm. and and it was after that that you got an email from Jean, who it was Jean Kerr, mm -hmm. you said, yeah. who wanted yeah. to who wanted all all that time ago she wanted and fought to try and adopt you and couldn't. And that, that moment reconnected the two of you. Mm. And you share how visceral that experience was for your body and also for hers too. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to be honest, I was, I was kind of horrified that that had happened. And of course, when I thought about it and I thought about the time it happened in, I was like, okay, well, I suppose. But it, it's always a shock to me when I hear examples like that. Um, it just it's it's it seems insane to anybody with a heart or a consciousness that that is what people have to go through. So I just share all that because that was one of the things that really struck me about your backstory and and your formative years and and what has turned you into this ambassador for others of incredible self love. Mm. You know it's fascinating as you thank you thank you for for sharing your experience with my experience. I appreciate that. And as you say what you say, I am sitting here thinking, my story is so common. It is more common than any of us could ever imagine. The difference is that I refuse to believe that my story did not deserve to move from the fringes, to move from the margins to the world stage. I fought for 17 years to have my story turned into a, a film. And I had the attitude, not an attitude of entitlement, like I am owed this, but it was more a personal entitlement. I owe this to my small self. My mother, no one in my clan, my family ever came for me, ever, ever, ever. So this is an entitlement that my younger self has with my good enough mother. I want her to feel entitled to all that I have, all that I am, the inner resources, the, the brilliance, the capacity, because I and people like me, the 500,000 children languishing in foster care, the 340,000 Black children who disproportionately languish in foster care, they, they, I am entitled <laughs> to 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 what I worked for because me like them they will never they will never benefit from their own parents class they will never benefit from their parents if their parents 
are educated and, and the socioeconomics, they will never benefit. They, if they're lucky, if they're lucky, if they're lucky to have someone say to them at some point in their lives, you can be somebody. And if they're, if they're genius and hungry enough where they can take that, plant it into a pocket of their mouth, and 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 like an oyster, let that let that encouragement become the reason for their inspiration. Let that inspirit their their intentions and their possibility. Because if they don't, given that there's no, as you said, a, a, a cheerleader. If there's no cheerleader, if nobody wants anything from you, if nobody expects anything from you, and you don't know any better, who? Good luck with all that. So my, my honor is to, is to give myself the best opportunities. And I know there's an axiom that says success is 80% preparation and 20% opportunity. Well, Lee, I'm as overeducated as any one person can be. I'm as over prepared as any one. Per- I, I am like a, I'm like a hoarder. I have so much capacity. I have so much in me. I have so much to give. It's, it's like this emotional experience, experience hoarder waiting to continue to press my own genius against the backdrop, right, of, of a life hoped for and uh, across the sky. So, yeah. You're a generator. So, you know, you're generating this energy and this life force for others to receive it. And, and I know what struck me was, you know, I heard you talk about this in an interview that you did. Did you say it was, how many times did the, the film get optioned? It was a lot. <laughs> like like re- repeatedly yeah right repeatedly so many times and i stayed with it It was like riding a riding a bull right yeah. and i'm like no nope, i'm not giving up from the writer strike executives you know the 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 executive structure getting restructured i'm like it doesn't matter and so in the in the interim i i took my story and had it adapted into a one woman show and the Sacramento theater company, I live in the Bay area had gave it a six week run with an extended two weeks. And that particular one woman show was the most successful production they had in years. People came once, they came like three, four, five times. And that my effort was to give my story legs, Mm. you know, to be a marketing, you know, guerrilla queen, guerrilla marketing queen, and find the ways to give it legs so that it was always relevant. So it went from being workshopped as a one woman show, which I had never done, but I loved doing it. And then I, you, I got to grad school because what happened was my attorney, I was, it was at this place where now it was going to be an independent film. It, it was positioned to be an independent film, which was my dream for it. And my attorney said, if this falls through, and I think, no, before it was going to be an independent film, Courtney Cox was position to do this. This was going to be Courtney Cox's directorial debut. Mm-hmm. I already saw, uh, what's her name? She's um, married to Lee Harper. Oh, she's an actress. I can't think of her name right now. Um, beautiful woman. She did the movie Ramblin' Rose. But oh, anyway. Laura Dunn? Laura Dunn. I was oh, like, yeah. Laura Dunn yeah. is going to play Jean and I want Jada Pinkett Smith to mm. play me. And so I had, I write like that with, with the yeah. idea of people. So anyway, that at the 11th hour, bags are packed, scenes are, you know, the, the, the scene shots are, are, are 
and organized and we, we, we have a schedule of the shoot and everything. And at the 11th hour, that crashed. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do? My attorney said, you know what? What are you going to do if this never happens? She was like, I want you to go and call all the universities in the country and tell them who you are. I'm like, what do you mean? Tell them who I am. I'm just me. She was like, no, honey, you're not just you. And I did. I called up universities and said, I would be willing to exchange my experience if you would be willing to have me, you know, create this uh, idea of a bartering, whatever, whatever. And I ended up going back to school and finishing my degree, my, my undergraduate. And then I went back and worked to get the um, PhD equivalent of, of a writing degree. Wow. wow. Fantastic, and it, and and I mean, I was I was going to ask you about your writing because you're you're a, you're a really really good writer, mm. so and that's that's a huge part of being able to capture your story. So when did you? So let's go back to the book, somebody, someone first. You, <laughs> how long did that take to write for you? Once you decided to do it, what was the what was the the time period, the process? That was the most terrifying experience ever. And it took two and a half years. That was... Because you're also healing, right? As you go through that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Let me put it to you like, oh, my goodness. (laughs) There was one point I was writing and I didn't understand grief. I didn't understand this idea of backdraft, Mm. right? This idea of emotional backdraft. And I did not recognize that when I began to write and my heart became compassionate, like meaning I, 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 without recognizing it, I was alleviating my own suffering. I was alleviating my own pain by facing it, by reliving it and giving those broken pieces, not broken pieces, but to give my, I'm careful when I say broken, but to give, to give my heart that had been stretched and pummeled and disfigured. So to give those, those disfigured parts of my heart an opportunity to show up some some parts were were too impacted other parts not enough so i had to sit and yeah. be with that and so it was very traumatic and i learned how to be with what i learned through the writing how to be with in present time what i couldn't possibly know how to be with when it was actually happening so it was profound the healing was profound and that took about like I said two and a half years and I was very 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 fortunate on my first book deal very very fortunate beautiful editor Karen Carmatch Rudy she really believed in the project and I've always been a visualizer. So I remember scratching out uh, whatever book was on the number one spot for the New York times book review. And I wrote before I even went to New York and sold my book, I put my book in and I wrote how much I wanted for the book in my check register (laughs) in terms of advance and every single thing just came boom, 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 boom. And then the second book, and then I couldn't write for about 17 years because, you know, there were reasons why that it had a lot to do with reunifying with the woman who I had lost as a child. And what I had to learn in that reunification is Prior to she and I reunifying, 30, nearly 30 years past the time she'd lost the right to be my mother, I was a different person. I grew to be somebody. I, I grew my life around 
not being someone's child, not being someone's cousin, not being someone's niece, not being someone's grandchild, not being someone's uh, sister on. And so I came into my own psychological and spiritual maturation without going through those rites of passages of what it means to belong in any in any real sense of space and time. So by the time that uh, she and I adopted one another, it, 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 uh, it, it shot, it, it, it dismantled the identity that I had constructed. And so there was no way I had a two book deal. There was no way I could write that second book because there was no self. Yeah. My self had been, blown to pieces and so I couldn't find the autobiographical eye from which to stabilize who I knew myself to be because I was I was constantly becoming now I'm a daughter now I'm a this or that and so it was just a complete you know 180 and so that took a while and I went back to school to get a, I wanted to get a master's. I wanted to understand because my book came out of, uh, it was just organic. I had a, I had an experience of walking to the BART station in San Francisco. Just a long story short, I had a dream the night before that I needed to pay attention to strangers on a train. I woke up, I go to work, and I was a hairdresser, business owner. None of my clients showed up that day. I took the day off. I went home to prepare for my son. Who was on my way home, I run into my biological father, who I hadn't seen since he abandoned me at the orphanage. He did not recognize me. And that, that, tore, that felt like skin being boiled off my flesh and I wanted to hurt myself and I left him standing on that bar station but before I left I turned to him and I said I want to give you something I, I want to say to you I forgive you for not being there for yourself and consequently not being there for me our earthly tethering is now over you're free to go you're no longer my earthly keeper and I turned and I walked away and I I was at 16th and mission and I got on the escalator and the little little Regina said see if he's looking at you see if he's looking at you and the older Regina's like girl why do you want to do this to yourself <laughs> you know that man is not looking for you but I I had to privilege her her desire and I turned and no, he was not looking for me at me. It was, it's not personal, right? It's, it's just, it's just what that is about for and about him. So as I go home at the time, I had a partner and we weren't talking that day and we, we, we had had a blow up. And so we were not available to one another on an emotional level and I went home and I thought I was going to slice my wrist. Mm -hmm. And something said, no, you're not going to do that. Don't be so dramatic, Regina, so melodramatic. And so that was my little girl. I'm going to cut my wrist like I did when I was a little girl. I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. And something said, find a, leave a message in your, in your voice, on the voicemail of your therapist, uh, voicemail just leave a message just tell her what happened because we kind of had that understanding should difficult things happen that she would be there just to be the receptacle for yeah. it and so i something said pick up a pencil and i'm like no something said pick up a pencil now i'm like no i'm not doing it something said pick up a pencil so i kind of crashed through my uh, drawer found the pencil then I took the bay guardian said something said sit down and write and I'm like I'm not going to do that something said sit 
down and right. And I sat down and it was like I couldn't breathe, Lee. And the next thing came out is careful not to disturb the raggedy screen door that barely kept the man eating mosquitoes from tearing our asses up. I linked my body into the frame and stared up at the sky. I could tell by the way the clouds moved that God was going to start crying soon. So wow. that was my book. And and I wrote the book without, it was it just kind of down drafted. It, mm-hmm. I just listened and I didn't know how to type. So it took me It took two and a half years because I didn't know how to type. I just packed, you know, 600 pages, sent it to my editor. She bought it and then she reshaped it. So, yeah, that's how I came to writing. And then because for me, it's always about being legitimate, you know, the feeling that being black, I'm illegitimate. I'm illegitimate to the human race. Being a woman, I'm illegitimate to the human race being unwanted. Oh my God, I'm Mm. illegitimate. So in every faction of my life, in all of the needs, physiological, safety, uh, love and belonging and esteem, there was just this deep sense of illegitimacy. So after my first book was written and I didn't really have a community because it just kind of came out of thin air. Hmm. You know, so I didn't build that up with people. And here I was a hairdresser. Now I'm writing this book that's getting all this, all this uh, attention. And later, you know, as I said earlier, when the movie kept falling through, falling through, falling through 17 years, I just developed a speaking career. I just started speaking all over the country. And that too gave my my story legs. So I have been in this game to give legs to this idea of adultification, right? Little black girls who are five to eight times more likely to be considered, uh, how do I say this? Let me take a moment. Let me take a breath. So adultification is this belief, constructed belief that Young Black girls don't deserve to be protected. They can handle psychosexual situations far better than their white counterparts and held to the same expectations as adults. So I had, I had to, to, to sort of uh, deal with that and... I was going somewhere with it. I just had a hot flash. I'm going to keep it real. If there are men listening to this, boys, I'm sorry, but mama just had a hot flash. <laughs> and with them damn hot flashes, they take my my ability to <laughs> extemporaneously rift. So we're going to take a beat. Okay? Okay. Okay. I love it. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, you know what I would love to ask you? Firstly, thank you for being so, it's funny because you and I said right before we got on this conversation, we both spoke about different vulnerabilities we were dealing with in our life right now. Thank you for being so incredibly vulnerable with us about all of this. You were so compelled, whether it was the voice of spirit or whether it was your mind, or and it was sounds like it was a little of both depending on the day, you were so compelled to bring your story forward to the world for a, for mm-hmm. a higher purpose that you were very, very determined about. Mm-hmm. What was it like when the book was out and when the movie was out and people started coming to you, whether it was via the street or email or people you met in speaking events, and they started to either thank you or reflect to you what you had help them unearth or begin to heal or heal or what was that like when when in a way the whole thing flipped and you'd done this mission of yours and now you were starting to see the the ripple effect coming back toward you or hearing about it or feeling it from people what 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 was that like hmm. i thought 
I mean, I thought different things at different times, right? Because sure, it's, yeah, of course. it's a journey. It's a, it's a very big, broad journey. You know, there were times when I appreciated being seen for something so simple in my mind. My, in my mind, the rebel in me said, when, when I was young and I would ask people, why don't my parents want me? What, what's going on? Well, they can't. Well, they're the, you know, all this. They made, people made a lot of excuses for them. But of course, now I get it. They didn't know. They didn't know how to be with me in my, in my, uh, in my painful humanity. And I made a, a pact. I'm good with making those pacts that, oh, I'm going to show you how easy this is. I'm going to show you that anybody who wants to can. And I'd like to believe I dream in equality. So I let the naysayers say what they're going to say. I let the haters say what they're going to say, but I'm going to get it done. Mm. I understand the assignment. And my assignment was to come here to show up and show out despite the fact that let everybody else tell it. I was a nobody's child. But what they didn't quite understand is I was always spirit's child. Mm -hmm. And so with spirit, there was a different assignment going on. And I put my ear to spirit's pulse and I listened to that. So when people came up when, when I could be resourced and, and, and not working from a place of vindictiveness. Some of my work, let's keep it real. It came out of, vind- I'm going to show you. It came out of rebellion. No, you don't. And it, you know, somebody tells me you don't get to have a movie made because there are no black people to play you. It's like, you know what? Watch this. <laughs> so it's so some of it has been determination as a result of someone eliminating or not even offering opportunities. So it's, you know what, let me let me become self-determined so I can get this done and have these people just sit down. Okay, just sit down somewhere. Nobody has no room for you anymore. And so there were different, I felt different things at different times. But when I kick back and I think about how it really felt when people came and reflected their story and people came and said, you know, this, that, or the other. As I have matured, I have made space for people. I can't say that I always had that space. I had the emotional maturity to be reflexive Mm. with, with those types of situations. But in that I grew into a speaker while simultaneously grew into this capacity for deep, deep emotional intelligence, I began to see, ah, we are all suffering. When people come to me and they say what they say and they see me, they can relate. They're not afraid of my suffering because they have an idea of their own. Mm-hmm. And this taps into the the shared humanity that Christian Neff so generously writes about. And I also was able to heal deep, deep cultural, cultural and race consciousness wounds. And what I mean by that is I grew up my latter part of my adolescence in solitary confinement. And I don't think it gets any more dehumanizing unless, of course, you're in a cage at the border. Mm. Right? As yeah. a child, separated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't think it gets as a child because we haven't lived the life of a 40 or a 50 year old. We, we, you know, I was 17 or you're like eight or nine in the cases of children at the border, but to be a black, beautiful, bright, 
talented girl. And to come up against systemic erasure the way that I did and make these promises while I was half naked in my feces, sometimes in my urine, and to know that in that containment, oftentimes the only thing that was there was the light that came over the threshold on the floor and then to to plant my hopes and dreams and desires into that, my one days, right? So when I remember that and people come and people say the things they say, to me, that's holy. Because what that means is when I planted those possibilities into that light, this is the boomerang. But them coming back and saying thank you, them coming back and saying what they say, them coming back and feeling some kind of way, then coming back and, and honoring my journey. Because see, when they honor my journey, what I make that mean is they understand that it's possible for them too. Absolutely. And the dignity. And I think that, that when they, when that now is about dignity, it's about, and what is dignity, Lee, other than self-worth? Mm-hmm. And so they, what they actually do is affirm what I know and work from, and that is my presence here on the planet is situated in a sense of being worthy. I am worthy. I'm worthy. I, I, I was worthy of my parents' love. I just wasn't worthy of my parents' love, right? It works both ways. Totally. I'm worthy. I'm worthy of my own love. I'm worthy of my own kindness. I'm worthy of the qualities that are inherently mine as a result of being born, cut from the same cloth that creates all of nature, right? I'm no, I'm no less magnificent than, what's my favorite? Fl- oh, I'm no less magnificent than a field of lavender in Provence, right? I'm no less, I'm, I'm as magnificent as that. You know, I, I'm just this, uh, as we all are. Hmm. We're just magnificence in action. Magnificence magnified when we allow that to be. So that's, that's the best way I know to answer that. There's so many ways of being and depending upon the state of mind I'm in when people, of course, you know, of course, it, I, I guess part of my reason for asking it was I was interest, I was interested in, in, cause in a way that moment when the book and the movie are out is, is both an arrival point and a turning point in the journey that you were on. So, and, and, and we know that we're always arriving, you know, I, I loved what you said about, I don't always have the emotional maturity or wherewithal to to be there in that moment, which is true for any of us. But I I was curious because, especially with this book, and it's funny, you know, again, I'm going to pull from your your tagline, kick ass strategies to bootstrap your way to unconditional self-love. For anyone who's watching this or (laughs) listening to this, if there is any doubt in anyone's mind that Regina is highly qualified, (laughs) to to give us some kick-ass strategies to bootstrap our way to unconditional self-love at this point, then I would be very surprised because <laughs> I think, it, I know, but seriously, I think it, you've only taken us into some of the surface of, of, of your childhood and your experience in this life. And I, I asked you to give us an insight into that. And you've only been able to take us into the surface, but the depth and the breadth of it is beyond what many people, thankfully, will have had to experience or endure in their life. But one of the things that, well, I'll ask you this, actually, because there's so many things I could 
we could go to now, but one title I wrote down, because your resilience to me is, resilience is the first word I wrote down about you. When I was watching some videos and listening to some things, I just wrote down in, the, in capitals, resilience. I was like, ah, oh, here's a resilience teacher. And resilience is one of her arts. And there was a, a chapter that you have that I wrote down um, or I, oh, here we go. Be the wild, wild mess of you. <laughs> now that really spoke to me today. Um, will you tell us a little bit about what the wild, wild mess, being the wild, wild mess of us is as a strategy, like, or, or, or anything you want to tell us about that chapter? Oh my God. You know, I, have you ever heard of the poet David White? Oh, yes. So a friend just sent me one of his books. Oh, my God. Hopefully Incredible. it's a belonging. But let me say this. All he t one of his, like, if you were to go, if I go through, comb through his content, the word frontier, 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 that's, that's his go-to word. And I thought about what is a frontier, really? It's that place that if we could return to again and again and again, it's where anything is possible. And so when I thought about be with the wild, wild mess of you, which my girl, Kat Quinn, who wrote part of the, you know, who wrote the trailer, who wrote the soundtrack for the trailer of my movie, I worked with her and she wrote a book. She wrote a song, sorry, to go with this uh, chapter to be with the wild, wild mess of you, because there's something profound about it. I work in a realm, in a field where people are encouraged to get messy. They're encouraged to take off the layers of loss, grief, disenfranchisement, brokenhearted, abandonment, codependence, narcissist, all of it. And when we, when we identify the patterns that get in the way. I'm a Hoffman process teacher, so it's all about the negative love syndrome. And so when we identify the patterns that become the default, the go-to in, in how we experience our life, it's, it's like the masks, right? It, patterns, masks, things that interfere with us being who we truly are, which are these beautiful, tiny little hearts of divinity. And over time, based on physiology, safety, love, belonging, and esteem, we sell ourselves out in order to get the physiological need met, to get the safety of what we think is the love and the belonging and the esteem. It all comes from our family of origin. So being with the wild, wild mess of you is to be with all of those ways of being, all of those belief systems that have impacted who you are, that have carved your, your character, you know, uh, against the world. This is who you are. And, or this is who you believe yourself to be. So being with the wild, wild mess of you, I invite the reader to recognize that there may be an outlaw that lives in you. Like I start the whole, the whole chapter off with a, with a uh, epigraph from Stagecoach Mayor. I carry a pistol. I drink. Don't nobody tell me what to do. Do you got a problem with that? I mean, it's just be what it is. Be who you are. And check the outlaw in you. Because she was like the first African-American uh, U.S. postal mail carrier. I can only imagine yeah. what she had to deal with or chose to deal with. So there are places and spaces and aspects of us where there are outlaws. You know, so where in your life do you do you allow the outlaw to be in charge? Is it in your relationships? Is it in your spending? Is it in your addicted addiction assumption? Where how does the outlaw show up in any of our lives at any given time? And how do we meet it? Who how do who are the townspeople 
Who are the townspeople, right? Those people you're going to call to at yep. least what? help you, yep. right? And yep. who are going to who are going to set you up, get out of the way. And and who's the sheriff, right? Who's the sheriff that can come and bring some order to this? And and so it just go. And, and sometimes you got to get a posse, you know, to rein it in. So I, I love, 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 love that strategy as well as uh, several of all of them, really. But the, the wild, wild mess of you is an invitation to drop in and learn to be with discomfort. Mm. Like we were speaking before. We were. We were, we, were, we were both sharing our versions of dealing with new discomfort at the moment, which is growing pain, <laughs> if, you, if you want to call it a pain. But it's, yeah, just the deep discomfort and vulnerability when you're shifting or when you're, when you're being asked to grow and change, which I, you know, I have no doubt is a worldwide phenomenon right now for anyone who isn't asleep at the wheel. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm so happy that resonated with you because it's. I love that particular strategy, and it was fun writing it. And I go into what what helped me grow. One of the next uh, strategies is to grow through what you go through. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really jazzed right now. I like you a lot now, right now. <laughs> I'm liking you a whole lot. <laughs> um, well, it's funny, grow, you know, grow through what you go through that. I, I like those two are together. The rebel in me uh, lit up when I saw the permission of the chapter be the wild, wild mess of you. Um, and I know that we don't have too much time left today, but I, I want to just highlight something which I know you're about to do. You told me before we got started that in the winter, you're going to be creating something called Writing for Your Life, an, Ooh, yeah. an online virtual experience that will also be a workshop. So I know that by the time this interview comes out, it may not yet be available at your website. But if people subscribe to your newsletter at mm -hmm. IamReginaLouise.com, which we will put in the links underneath the show, they, they can learn more about that. But I love that you now want to help other people go through their process of writing for their life. Can you share anything about it at the moment? Who is I had I had the inaugural uh, in-person retreat a couple of years ago and at that time I used a a framework that I learned from a brilliant, brilliant screenwriter who wrote Walk the Line mm. and uh, Gil Dennis. And he had this process that I went through with him, you know, on, on many occasions until it became a, a methodology that I understood. And it helped people find their story. And so I noticed that the, the participants from what I observed and, the, and because we were there, we started with a, with a restorative justice circle because there was so much diversity. I wanted to do everything I could to, to maximize the experience with safety protocols and to allow, to, to invite others to invite themselves in and, to honor the difference that was there and the writing that came out of it, the understanding Pat Snyder, who is the founder of the Amherst writers program says, even speaking is writing on the wind. So mm -hmm. this idea that we privilege the language arts in every way it shows up. I want to hold people in that space. I want to offer people an opportunity to work with their inner child, their emotional child. I want to support them in working with their good enough mother. I want to support them in working on compassion. So it'll be different modules that will be released at different times. And 
I I love being that teacher, Sherpa, guide. And so they will, if they subscribe, as you said, at www.iamreginalouise.com, then I will keep them abreast. And I will always have somebody spotlighted, albeit a poet, a writer. I have a lot of writer friends and poets and screenwriters, you know, so I will pepper these experiences with sort of like how you're doing in the podcast, but I'll do it in the online writing format. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I know that will be a big success. And I just want to say thank you for coming on the show today. And thank you for for sharing so much of yourself and so vulnerably. I know for a fact it will have a ricochet effect on the viewer and on the listener. And I also just want to say good luck with everything you're rebirthing and growing through, kind of like what we touched on. We both said we're in new growth phases, the discomfort early birth part maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know what, uh, Pastor Lee? Oh, I'm sorry. I, mean, I meant to say Lee Harris. I didn't mean to call him <laughs> Lee. One of, one of the things that's so exciting, I, I did say earlier, thank you for inviting me onto your platform. What's what's real here? And I must speak to it. I am I am like a unicorn as a black woman with a voice and personal growth and self-help. Mm. This is amazing. You know, with my own publisher who you know quite well and intimately, I'm like the first black woman that they have worked with, the only two in 50 years. No so, oh, yes, yeah. So, but you know, it's just the way it is. It you is, know how the yeah. book business it, it, it's not about people, it's not about that, it's about bottom line dollars. You mm. have an audience, and so on, so on. So, first of all, I'm so grateful to be in this space and to be recognized in this space of metaphysics and personal growth and you know, initiates, right? Seekers who want to better understand what it means to be in the duality of this thing called our one life. So again, this is, a, this is, a, I'm an, like an anomaly in a way mm. in this field. And so I'm always grateful when I get that opportunity to, to be in conversation. So thank you. Well, we and the world are lucky to have you and it's as simple as that. So Thank you. And uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for all your beautiful work. And to everyone watching and listening today, this is Regina's latest book, Baby, and it's fantastic. Permission granted. Um, and we will put links to the book and Regina's website and also perhaps a link to the Lifetime movie. Uh, you got it. It's on Amazon now. So Amazon Prime, yes. Amazon Prime. So we'll put all the links in the show notes underneath the video or in, uh, in the audio version. Regina, big love. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for being here and uh, good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you, brother. And I will <laughs> see you next time. All right. Much love. Beautiful. Thank you, Regina. Bye. Own Your Value is my course for entrepreneurs, creatives, change makers who want to expand the work they do in the world. You know, I've done this for 16 years now and one of the hardest things that I ever went through was learning how to own the value of what I did. And I think that's really human, especially when you first start working for yourself. But also, sometimes, if you're working in a slightly more esoteric field or the healing fields or the fields of the arts, it's how can we place a value on our work both energetically but also sometimes financially. And the thing about money and energy exchange is people, myself included, will pay for something that they receive value and energy from. So one of the biggest things that you often have to work out if you are looking to expand your business is, well, how can I increase the value in the services that I'm offering to people? How can I get more behind that so that what they receive to them is inherently valuable? And this is true whether you're offering free work in the world, which we do a lot of, or if you're offering paid experiences for people. 
So Own Your Value is a few different things. It's a course that's designed to be a starter kit for those of you that are perhaps new to putting your own work in the world, but you want to find different ways to offer things, how you can expand your message, your services, your work. But equally, it's for those of you who might be doing this work part-time or you've just started and you know you want to scale what you're doing. You want to serve more people, reach more people, and also grow your mission. So if you feel that you would like to take your work, your mission, and what you're offering to the world to the next level, I invite you to check out Own Your Value and see if it resonates with you and if it's right for you. There are many different modules covered. It's all video and audio teaching, so you can access it anytime. And once you're in the course, you have it for your lifetime. Also, I'm running some live clinic calls where I will be speaking to those of you in the course about your direct questions and answering them in real time on live calls that will then be archived. We've had over 600 students go through the course so far and we're thrilled to be relaunching it at a time where I'm aware that many of you will be looking to expand the way you work in the world and the way that you offer your work in the world. We hope to see you there.